All right. Um, well, again, my name is Will Van Wagen. Uh, the reason I'm, I guess, talking about Iraq, you know, a little bit about the country, is I spent about seven months there working for a small human rights organization in 2005 and 2006. So I was in Baghdad for about four months and in the northern area uh, in Kurdistan for about three months. Um, and anyway, so in addition to living there and speaking some Arabic, I just, you know, I'm interested in it, so I do a lot of reading as well. So hopefully you guys will learn some stuff. It's a little bit hard to speak to these crowds because people are pretty informed, you know, but hopefully there'll be some new information that I give anyways. And I'll I'm gonna say some things that are different from last night I spoke at the Utah. RSU one, and there's some people here today that were there yesterday, so hopefully I can say some different things. We'll have a little bit of a different focus, but um, I guess to start out, um, a lot of people generally feel like the um, invasion of Iraq was a response to 9 11. Um, hey, these terrorists attacked us, and so now we have to go on the offensive, and even if we don't know if Saddam Hussein really has weapons of mass destruction. After 9/11, you know, we can't wait for the for the smoking gun to become a mushroom cloud, as Congress rights like to say. So they, the Bush administration portrayed the invasion of Iraq as a response to 9/11, but in fact, plans to invade Iraq um, had begun literally the first weeks of the Bush administration. There were meetings that um, um, were going on um, with you know top people in the administration to plan. Um, invading Iraq, and so when 9/11 hit, um, they just saw it as a, you know, it was just like the perfect pretext or opportunity for them, or something they could take advantage of, in order to do something that they already wanted to do. And so, literally, the day of 9/11, or the, the first meetings that, that the administration had to respond to 9/11, people like Paul Wolfowitz um, were bringing up the idea like, hey, we should invade Iraq. And President Bush said, no, let's take care of Afghanistan first. That's what kind of like people, you know, will be expecting what Americans would want. And then we can do Iraq after. So that's exactly what they did. So in addition to, um, you know, just kind of acting like 9-11, uh, well, part of, part of, the, of convincing people that Iraq had a tie to 9-11 and the Saddam was somehow responsible for 9-11, um, there was a member of Al-Qaeda that was arrested or detained in 2002 named uh, Ibn Shedgalibi. And he was interrogated and waterboarded and tortured by the CIA. Um, and the interrogators were told deliberately to try to find a link between 9-11 and the Iraqi uh, government. And even after the CIA agents who were torturing him had basically decided, hey, we can't get any more information out of this guy, and they declared him meaning that they didn't need to interrogate him and torture him anymore. Donald Rumsfeld gave the order saying, no, keep going, keep going. And so finally this guy, who was probably like a mid-level Al-Qaeda operator, not even a really super important guy, just to get the torture to stop, he finally just started making up stuff that, oh yeah, like Al-Qaeda has training camps in Iraq, and we got training from the Iraqi government, etc. So once he finally just, to get the torture to stop, started making up stories about that connection, then the Bush administration, of course, used that information, and Colin Powell um, used information that this guy, um, the Libby, just made up in order to um, go before the UN and make the case of the war, um, et cetera. So torture played a really important role in getting the war started, in addition to all the torture that went on um, as a result of the war that you guys have all heard of. So that's how, how the, the ball got rolling. And the reasons for the war, just to talk about those, in my view, there are three kind of main reasons. Um, one is oil. The second is just making money for weapons manufacturers and contractors like Lockheed Martin and Halliburton. Um, and then the third thing is to make an example. Iraq was actually a very weak country, and US intelligence knew that, that as a result of a decade of sanctions and the way and the things that the United States had done to basically destroy that country in the first world war which is really barbaric and horrific, like some of the most terrible things you can imagine the United States did in the first Gulf War, and then in the meantime, during the sanctions regime from, you know, uh, 91 until 2003, the things the United States did literally led to um, probably about a million um, deaths of Iraqis, excess deaths because of the, the things that happened, the bombing in the first Gulf War and the sanctions. 
So if you don't know a lot about that history, I'd recommend looking it up like Iraq sanctions and do some reading because it's really horrific. Um, but again, we'll focus on the current war tonight. Um, so, but they knew that Iraq was very weak and they, they knew that if they invaded Iraq, it would just be quick and easy. And it turns out it was, you know, they got to Baghdad in two weeks and Bush got up on an aircraft carrier and said mission accomplished and it went exactly according to plan. They knew that they would just walk all over the Iraqi army and they did. Um, so it wasn't that they were worried that Iraq was a threat to us. They didn't really know if Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. It seems like they kind of sincerely believed that they did. But again, that was just an additional pretext to go to war. It wasn't that they felt like the United States was being threatened by anything that Iraq could do, including you know, having weapons of mass destruction. In fact, invading Iraq was the thing that would actually increase the chances that Saddam would use weapons of mass destruction. And it turns out now, in retrospect, that the reason Saddam kind of tried to stay ambiguous about whether he had those weapons, even though he didn't, he tried to give off the, the sense that he did have them, was because that was you know, his only hope to really deter the United States from invading, is if he could get the US to think that he really did have weapons. So that's why he kind of kept up that facade that he really had them, even though we're from the US thinking, why doesn't he just like prove he doesn't have them and then everything will be okay? No, I mean the United States would be able to pay anyways. And again, that was his kind of only hope of preventing the invasion. So um, in regards to oil, again, a lot of people kind of feel like, well, we did it for oil, which is accurate, but they misunderstand a little bit about why or why oil was important. And people kind of feel like, uh, you know, you may be seen, you know, that uh, hippies will have like a bumper sticker on their car that said like, you know, no war so you can like drive an SUV or something like that. The idea being that, well, hey, we, we need cheap oil to run our economy and we need uh, cheap oil so we can live this indulgent lifestyle to drive our SUVs. And that's why the Bush administration went to war. Um, and so that's actually totally not the case. Um, even if nobody in the United States drove SUVs, it was still a important from the Bush administration's perspective to invade Iraq to control the oil for a couple reasons. Number one, that gives the United States major leverage against um, other countries in the world that could potentially be our enemies. And the main country to think of in this respect is China, who doesn't have its own independent sources of oil and energy. That's why they're always trying to make connections with Sudan and Venezuela and countries in Africa. Their, their economy is growing and they're really fighting to secure energy um, supplies. So if the United States has basically its hand on the spigot of world oil um, production and supply, which is primarily in the Middle East, if China ever causes us any problems, all the US has to do is cut off their supply of oil. It would immediately destroy their economy and they wouldn't be able to fight a war because every major, every military in the world runs off of oil. You need tons and tons of oil to fight a war. So it's a way, basically, to maintain American dominance in the world. The other aspect of it is that, is that um, U.S. planners understand that there is a finite amount of oil. It may not, you know, it's according to some estimates by the big oil companies, like, we may run out of oil in maybe, you know, 75 or 100 years. So that's in like one or two lifetimes. So if there's only a finite amount of oil, and our economy and the world in general is having an extremely difficult time transitioning to different sources of energy. So that oil is going to become more and more important to preserve our like, security. And so if there's not that much oil left, it's better that we control it and we have it under our power than you know, leaving it up to, like say, these crazy Iraqis to control oil or the Saudis or whoever else. So if we can have a friendly client regime in Iraq, which has um, about a third of the world's oil, then that's going to be a major strategic advantage to us. The other thing is that um, there was actually, within the US government, two factions, I guess, who had a different agenda for oil beyond what I've talked about from like a military strategic perspective. And on the one hand, you have the neocons like Paul Wolfowitz and Donald Rumsfeld. And these people believe in um, basically like shock doctrine style, um, uh, basically trying to, um, 
this kind of like revolutionary ideology of trying to convert the entire world into like a free market capitalist system. And so their plan actually was to go into Iraq and privatize the oil industry. And not just privatize the oil industry, privatize everything, privatize all the state owned um, companies. Like Iraq was pretty much a socialist country, like tons of things were owned by the state, factories. Healthcare system, like everything was nationalized pretty much. Not everything, but like major industries were. So they wanted to go in, impose a flat tax, sell off all the state run industries, put everybody out of work, and just sell off all of Iraq's assets to like foreign buyers and turn it into just like a free market paradise, which is something that they would love to do in the United States but aren't able to. Um, just get rid of all regulations, etc. And so actually, with um, with that faction, they actually didn't want low oil prices. They thought, well, if we privatize Iraq's oil, this is a way to destroy OPEC by having the Iraqis produce so much oil that it lowers the price and reduces the power of the Saudis. It makes Iraq kind of the big player in the oil world, again, under our control of the friendly uh, government. And it would, um, again, reduce the power of the Saudis. But the other faction was, and those people were all based in the Pentagon, the other faction was the State Department and the big oil companies in the US and James Baker. And their big concern was that, and the reason they really wanted invasion is because as the sanctions regime from again 91 to 2003 was, was kind of falling apart, Saddam was doing a better and better job circumventing the sanctions, selling more, more oils, um, smuggling more oil abroad, and so it was increasing the amount of oil that was coming out of the world market. So that does really bad things for the oil companies because that means whatever they own, their reserves of oil are suddenly worth less. There's way more oil on the market. So their plan basically was to actually not even pri not privatize Iraq's oil, to keep it a, a, a national oil company, again, a, a pro-US government control have American corporations actually producing the oil and getting service contracts to produce it and make money that way, but also re keep at very low levels the amount of Iraqi oil that was produced in order to keep supply low and prices high so that all the oil, again, that the oil companies own, wherever it happens to be, the value of that either stays where it's at or goes up. And so as a result of the Iraq war, oil prices did go through the roof and the value of the oil reserves of the big five oil companies Chevron, uh, Conoco, et cetera, ExxonMobil, increased by about $2 trillion. So they just made the killing. And so there was this fight between, again, the Pentagon and the State Department about what would happen with Iraqi oil, and it was the big oil companies in the State Department that won out and managed to keep Iraq's oil nationalized, uh, but again, keeping production so low that the oil companies would make a huge amount of money. So those were the reasons for the war. So in 2003, um, maybe you guys know this, probably know this already, but as a result of the initial bombing and all the different airstrikes and, and things that the United States did in the initial invasion, um, according to the Lancet um, Journal, um, about 100,000 um, Iraqis were killed. And they had, the US had this doctrine of shock and awe bombing, which was really meant to totally bring Iraqi society to a total standstill the target infrastructure. And basically, in the way it's described in, this, in, the, in the strategy that was written down by the author of, of this new strategy of shock and all bombing, was that um, the US would, by bombing, would try to have the same effect on you know, whatever, whoever our enemy was that the atomic bombs had on the Japanese that were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. To just use such overwhelming force that Basically, the, there's no will to resist on the part of your enemy, and it's their, their infrastructure is destroyed, and there's just no way for them to even resist. So again, uh, it's no surprise that about 100,000 people probably died as a result of that initial invasion and a lot of airstrikes that the U.S. did in that first year. Um, strangely enough, Iraqis, for the most part, were pretty um, welcoming of the United States, even though the United States had done a lot of terrible things to Iraq, especially in the First World War 91 and then throughout the period of sanctions. But life was so bad for Iraqis, they'd become so poor and, and things were just were pretty terrible. And so they were just kind of like, any change is a good change. 
So maybe this is what the Libyans are thinking too right now. Like they're fighting against Gaddafi. Hey, we got our back against the wall, and they really do. And if Gaddafi manages to overrun some of these cities, he'll probably just like murder and slaughter like tens of thousands of people. I mean, it's going to be ugly. But this, you know, so when your back is against the wall, whoever that person is that can come save you, you know, you're like, oh, uh, you know, maybe things will improve. And so that was the attitude. They really thought, well, America could still come and save them. As time went on, not even that long, maybe like six months, people realized, as a result of the things that the United States was doing, that the U.S. hadn't come to help them or liberate them, but instead the U.S. had come to occupy their country, uh, to rape their natural resources, uh, and basically punish the Iraqi population rather than actually try to help them out. So I remember one time sitting in a, there was this one guy who was chatting, living in Baghdad, in 2005, and again, things had gotten way worse than they had been before the war. And he was he was saying, you know, if only you know someone could just come save us. You know, there's got to be some other country or someone that can come and save us. And kind of joking around, and I'm like, oh, I thought America already did that. You know, and he was not happy with me. When I made that joke. But anyway, that's a natural thing to feel if you're in a bad spot. You know, whoever the hell, whoever we get it from, we want it. So, some of the things the United States did that made life so bad is number one, Paul Bremer, again, basically to punish the civilian population. Um, he disbanded the army, disbanded Iraq's army that put uh, about 350,000 people out of work. He also sold off all those state run industries, like I said, and even passed a law saying that the Iraqi Central Bank could not fund any state run enterprises. That put about 500,000 people out of work. So a few years after the U.S. had come and occupied the country, the unemployment rate in Iraq was like at 50%. So, I don't know, think about what life would be like in the U.S. if there was 50% unemployment. Even in the Great Depression, I think it was like 30% or something like that, in the worst period in the U.S. history. The other thing the United States tried to do was cut off food rations to people because they thought it was like a socialist thing. Even though, because people were so poor during the sanctions here from 91 to 2003, Saddam instituted a rations program where every Iraqi citizen had, a, had like a voucher card where they could go and just get basic things like rice and oil so that people weren't starving. And that was one of the plans of, of the U.S., of the, of the coalition provisional authority was to like end those uh, rations, even though people in Iraq were still extremely poor and their situation hadn't improved at all. Again, just because this was like socialism and they were trying to establish capitalism. So really cruel things that, that the United States did. So in addition to that, um, you know, the American soldiers on orders from their superiors acted in really brutal ways. You know, the insurgency started pretty early. So if anyone, you know, say there were some American soldiers that were attacked, um, from a certain neighborhood, the soldiers would go into it, that neighborhood and arrest every like adult male, everyone from like the ages of 16 to like 45, and they throw them in prison in Abu Ghraib or in Bukka down in Basra, and um, you know they would just be in this black hole and be there for six months, for a year without a trial. Obviously, from Abu Ghraib, you guys know how they're being treated, being tortured, um, people being raped, people being sodomized by electric lights. Um, to masturbate in front of women, these big pyramids of, of naked men, in addition to people just being beaten to death and things like that. Um, so that's another reason why, again, people started to turn on the Americans very quickly. One example of that is in the city of Fallujah, which is in Anbar province. It's a Sunni town. And when the U.S. first occupied that area, the, there was basically no resistance during the first invasion. People didn't like Saddam. No one really wanted to fight to protect him. So the U.S. occupied a school, and the Fallujans weren't happy about that, and so they had a big nonviolent protest to try to ask the Americans to leave the school, and um, some American soldiers shot seven people, or seven of the demonstrators. And so after that, the people were like, okay, never mind, we don't really want the Americans here, and that's when the insurgency in Fallujah started. Um, same type of things were going on in other parts of the country, um, in the Shiite areas too, in Najaf, for example. And so in 2004, you had um, really a broad-based insurgency that was comprised of both Sunni groups, which is again one ethnic group or one sect of Islam, 
that's prominently Iraq, and then you had resistance groups that were based among the Shiite community, which is the other uh, Muslim ethnic group or sect. And they were actually working together. So when fighting broke out in Fallujah, um, uh, which is again a Sunni area, the Shiite groups, the Mahdi army for example, they sent fighters to go and help the Sunnis in Fallujah. And then the same thing, the, the, the Mahdi army got into these big battles with, um, with the American army in the city of Najaf. Maybe you guys saw footage of that on TV. There was a huge cemetery in Najaf, which is like a Shiite holy city. There's a big golden dome, um, a mosque for the Imam um, Ali. And there's a huge cemetery. It's like as big as the city of Warm. And Shiites from across the world like bring their dead there to be buried. Um, so, anyways, there were these. There was like a couple week long battle that was going on in this cemetery between the U.S. soldiers and the Mahdi army. And so the Sunni resistance groups were actually sending fighters to help, um, help the Shiites. So at that period of time, there was this idea like everyone was united against the occupation, and there wasn't the sectarian um, hatred and violence that you see that you see later. So people often get the impression that well, there are these different ethnic groups in Iraq, and they hate each other, and so um, the. The U.S. had to stay in Iraq in order to prevent a civil war. These people hated each other for centuries, and it's only the presence of the U.S. that's going to prevent you know, them from just killing each other, right? So we got to, we got to stick around. That was what you heard just all the time, nonstop in, in the media. And what people don't understand is that, in fact, it was the U.S. presence that caused the sectarian divisions. So here's an example, again, going back to Fallujah. Uh, did you guys all hear about the instance where the, those four Blackwater contractors were driving an SUV through Fallujah, they were attacked and uh, RPGs, and then their, their bodies were pulled out of the SUV and like drug through the streets and hung from a bridge? Yeah. Yeah. You hear about that? So, um, some of the local insurgent groups in, in Fallujah did that. Actually, um, what's interesting, they did that in, in response to the assassination of Sheikh at Ahmed Yassin, who was the um, paraplegic, really old guy, paraplegic, that was the founder of Hamas in Palestine. And he was assassinated by the Israelis in Gaza like early in the morning when he was driving with his kids to the mosque to go pray. Uh, help an Israeli help, well, American made Israeli helicopter came and shot some missiles at his car and killed him. And so the insurgents in Iraq that attacked those Blackwater uh, mercenaries openly said that that was like a attack and revenge for the, 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 the assassination of Ahmed that you see in Gaza. At any rate, so once that happened, you know, you, you can't mess with the United States like that and not, um, you know, George Bush was like, oh, we got to do something, right? So he sent the Marines in to assault the city, but in addition to that, they tried to get um, Sunni Iraqis to join the Iraqi army and to go in and do some of the fighting, you know, so that the Americans don't have to be going door to door killing getting killed, you always, you know, if you're occupying a country, you try to get indigenous forces to do the dirty work for you. So the United States tried to do that, but all of these army units that were made up of Sunnis from that same area of Fallujah, they all basically deserted. They were like, well, we don't want to fight against fellow Iraqis. That's not what we signed up, you know, in the army for. We don't want to kill people from our same town and our same village and blah, blah, blah. So that was just a total disaster for the U.S. So what did they do? Well, they're like, okay, well, if Sunnis aren't going to, we can't get Sunnis to kill other Sunnis, well, why don't we get Shiites from a different part of the country to come to this area and kill these people because they're not their neighbors, they're not their, you know, co-religionists, etc. So that's what the U.S. did. They, in all of Anbar province, they brought in Shiite um, army units in the newly created U.S.-backed Iraqi army to do the fighting. And so in Fallujah and Keith and Paditha, all these cities, he had Shiites going through and, and um, fighting against the Sunnis. So again, you have two levels of a civil war there. First, you had the U.S. just trying to get recruit Iraqis to fight on behalf of the U.S. against other Iraqis. So that's one aspect of civil war, right? But then again, as I mentioned, it, they escalated it and made it not just pro-occupation Iraqis versus anti-occupation Iraqis who were the majority. It was Sunni Sunnis versus Shiites. 
And so the Sunnis were killing the Shiites, members of the army, because they were collaborating with the occupiers. But eventually, if enough killing goes on, you don't just start killing people because they're collaborating with the US. If they're from a different ethnic group who you're already maybe a little bit suspicious of, you just start hating them because they're Shiites. Um, and then same thing, the Shiites were considering all of the Sunnis, they eventually started considering them all terrorists. And it didn't help that um, fighters from Al Qaeda were coming into the country and doing suicide bombings and Shiite markets because Al Qaeda did have a very anti-Shiite ideology. So pretty soon all this killing is going on and people kind of, at some point they're just like, you know what, um, the only people I trust are people that are from my ethnic group and, you know, I hate all Shiites. Or again, I hate all Sunnis. Just like, oh, sorry. Yeah, and what's the time frame where, where it starts becoming that sectarian sort of switch? So this is like, this is like 2005-ish. So um, things started going in a bad direction. Another thing that, that, that happened was that because the US was having such a hard time containing the insurgency, they, um, again, they did what they could to just arrest a lot of people and torture them to get information out of them. And it wasn't just people they suspected were insurgents that they were tortured for information. Eventually, they would just like go and pick up random people and think to themselves, you know, these are locals. You know, they may not be the ones attacking us, but they probably have some information about whatever group in this town is in Auburn Grave, wherever, that's attacking us. And so they would just torture people who they figured were innocent, but just to try and get information out of them. Or if they knew that, say, um, there was a wanted person, insurgent that they were looking for, they would go try to arrest that person, and he wouldn't be home, you know, who was just hanging out at home all the time if you're active in the insurgency. So they would be like, okay, and they would just like detain and arrest his wife their son and they would tell the family uh, if you want your son or your your you know your, your mom back you need to have your dad turn himself in otherwise and they would take people off and just have them in prison and obviously torture them and do bad things to them just in who they knew were innocent but just in a way to get the people that they really wanted but even despite that the US had such a hard time handling the insurgency that they um, turned to what um, was referred to by US planners as the El Salvador option. So for people that are hopefully in communist slash socialist and anarchist circles, people are a little bit familiar with the civil war that went on in El Salvador in the 1980s. There was a Marxist insurgency that was fighting against the right-wing uh, US-backed military dictatorship. And so in El Salvador, the US had military advisors that were training these elite units of the Salvadoran army. And these people would go around and just murder people. Um, they were just running death squads, right? So the U.S. took two people that were really instrumental in running these death squads in El Salvador back in the 80s and brought them to Iraq, um, namely John Degraponte and a guy named James Steele. So they came to Iraq to oversee a similar death squad um, program. And so what the, um, what the U.S. did was take members of a particular uh, militia called the Bader Brigade which had been incorporated into the Iraqi Ministry of Interior and just sent them out on a killing spree. And so these people would go um, and arrest Sunnis, they were Shiites, they would arrest Sunnis and um, torture them and kill them. So this is about 2005 when this started really um, heating up. And so suddenly you started finding uh, bodies of Sunnis um, in the rivers and just in the streets, etc. Many of whom had been um, tortured with electric power drills. Like we used to like, screw and put screws through, you know, building a house, like electric, like a black and electric power drill, through their head, through their chest, through their arms, everything. So they torture these people, use power drills to torture them, and then kill them, and just throw their body in the street. Um, so that also increased the sectarian hatred, too, because, again, it was Shiites doing it to Sunnis. And so that got to the point where, in 2006, there was a famous mosque that was blown up in Samara, um, supposedly by Al Qaeda, it was like a revered, like a Shiite holy place, a Shiite mosque. And so, as a result, when that mosque blew up, um, it just turned into total anarchy in the majority sense, where people just started Sunnis were just killing people just because they're Sunnis, and Shiites killing people just because they're Shiites. And that was like the height of the sectarian war. There was what people talked about as the Battle of Baghdad, where Basically, um, 
in every mixed neighborhood that had some Sunni and some Shia, whoever was kind of the minority group in that neighborhood, you know, would get ethnically cleansed and kicked out. And so Baghdad became pretty much a Shiite city, but even in those areas that were still held by the Sunnis, they, you know, murdered and kicked out all the Shiites. And again, the Shiites murdered and kicked out all the Sunnis. So you have that situation where in 2004, Sunni and Shia were working together. But by 2006, they just totally hated each other and it was not about sectarian war. And the U.S. was like kind of in the background. And again, in the news, you mostly hear about suicide bombings, of course, because they're spectacular and a lot of people die at once. But um, most of the casualties in the Iraq war, which are probably in the roughly one million range, according to just some of the best estimates that have been done by John Hopkins, John Hopkins University and some other polling, outfits, um, most people actually die from gunshot wounds. So you can just think about just how many people are just getting killed, um, again, that you don't even hear about. And one thing that's pretty interesting about like the WikiLeaks stuff that came out is that throughout this whole period of time, Iraq Body Count was this group in the UK that's been counting casualties, and they've come up with a number of like 120 or 1,000 or something in that range. And when the WikiLeaks documents came out, initially in the media there was this um, an, an op-ed in the Washington Post that came out and said, well, WikiLeaks just kind of confirmed what we already know, what Iraq body count you know, came up with, that about 100, you know, 10, 20,000 people they killed during the Iraq war. Um, but one of the guys who did that original Lancet study for John Hopkins University, um, indicating that about 100,000 people had died by 2004, some, um, he's a professor at Columbia University. They went through and did an analysis and actually just tried to match up and see, well, here's a death from the WikiLeaks cables. Let's see if it matches up with Iraq body count. And only about one out of, well, only about, no, sorry, 16% of them matched up. So again, there's so many deaths that, that occurred that just never get reported in the media, never, you know, that, that nobody ever knows about. Um, so eventually, because this got so bad, and because the, the Shiites that were collaborating with the US and were part of the Iraqi government in fighting against the Sunni insurgency, all of those Shiites, for the most part, had taken had been in exile in Iran for like the last 20 years or so. And they came back into Iraq along with the American soldiers. And so they were kind of hated too because people considered them traitors, they were in Iran during that time. They talked about how they came back to Iraq on the backs of the tanks of the occupiers. And those are the people that were actually helping the US were the very, very um, pro-Iranian Shiites, which seems weird because we hate Iran, right? The US government does. But it was the pro-Iranian Shiites that we put into power that were helping us. And so both the Iranian government and the US government had the same allies in Iraq. Um, so as a result of that, this, the, the Sunnis started talking about two occupations. They said, well, there's the American occupation, and there's the Iranian occupation. Because of these pro-Iranian Shiites, they control the government, which means they control the Ministry of Interior, which means they control the army. And so eventually, the, the Sunni uh, resistance groups came to the conclusion that, hey, the Americans are going to have to go eventually. You know, they're from the other side of the world. They can't stick around forever but the people that could stick around forever are the Iranians, um, who, who they already hated from the Iran-Iraq war during the 80s. And so a lot of the Sunni resistance groups actually decided we can't fight everybody at once. The Iranians, uh, or the pro-Iranian Iraqis and the Iranians are the bigger danger. And so they um, basically kind of called a truce with the US, um, also because the US started paying them money so you guys have heard about the Awakening Councils, right? This is how the Awakening Councils were formed, like these Sunni militias that were sponsored by the U.S. The U.S. would give them weapons and like 300 bucks a month per fighter. And so those groups started fighting against both Al-Qaeda and call out, which call the truce with the Americans again so that they could um, just focus on fighting like the Shiites instead. So at any rate, it got really nasty and and sometimes in wars, we have the idea that there's like the good guys and the bad guys, right? In Iraq, at least from the time I was there, and just, you know, my impressions is that the violence got so bad and so out of control that you can't really speak of like good guys. Clearly the United States are the good guys. 
but the Sunni and a lot of people in the resistance didn't really turn out to be the good guys. And the Shiites, um, again, whether they were the pro Iranian ones or the more nationalist ones um, that were led by Fatah al-Assad and the Bakhti army, they weren't good guys either. I mean, there was just, it was just such a, a bloodbath. I mean, everybody was just killing everybody. Um, so the violence kind of finally started dying off in Iraq once that ethnic cleansing had been completed. You know, once there were no more mixed neighborhoods, you, know, you didn't have a, if you're a Sunni, you didn't have a Shiite neighbor anymore. The communities were basically divided, and the Sunni resistance groups had given up, basically fighting the Americans. And so finally, you know, there was a little bit more calm. So there's still big problems in Iraq. I mean, there's still bombings and things like that. But the violence is, you know, nearly like it was from especially 2005 through 2008. And, um, but again, the situation economically, um, from a health perspective, poverty, uh, unemployment, access to drinking water, access to electricity, all these things, I mean, the situation is really terrible. So life under um, Saddam, as bad as it was, is still like way, way better than it is now. People, you know, the Iraqis I know in Utah, there's a lot of Iraqi refugees here, and almost all of them that I talked to, they reminisce about the days of, you know, under Saddam. Not because they were really like him at the time, but just in comparison to the, what happened and how things are now, it was just like way, it was just way, uh, way better. Um, one other thing to mention, and then maybe go to some questions, is to talk about, again, some of these different resistance groups. Because again, in the, in the U.S., I mean, it is just me speculating, but the only group you ever heard about was Al Qaeda in Iraq, and the only person or insurgent you ever heard about was Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who was the leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq, a Jordanian guy. And you got the impression that the suicide bombings that Al Qaeda was doing that that was like the only violence going on in the country, um, when in fact the vast majority of the attacks. Taking place were attacks against U.S. soldiers, like convoys, roadside bombs, things like that, that were being carried out by the nationalist Sunni insurgent groups that nobody's like, ever heard of. But it was because the Al Qaeda, because the suicide bombings, number one, are so visible and have so many casualties. I mean, you have to probably do 20 roadside bombs before you kill one American soldier, but one suicide bomber that walks into a Shia market, you know, you kill 50. So. In addition to that, it's just kind of easier to publicize, but it, it seems to me that there was a deliberate attempt on the part of the U.S. to really, you know, make Osama uh, Zarqawi, like, like, through U.S. propaganda, like, really pump it up. He's, like, you know, the main enemy, which, again, makes us, like, oh, hey, we're just fighting Al-Qaeda. We've got to stick around. This is a good war, rather than acknowledging, hey, who we're really fighting are nationalist Iraqis who just don't want occupation. So even though Al Qaeda and the foreign fighters were a very small um, group in the overall insurgency, again they got almost all the attention. So if you never heard about just to go through some of the names of these other groups, there was the um, Islamic Front for the Iraqi Resistance, which was a really big one. There was the Islamic Army. Um, there was the Ansar al-Sunni, which is like partisans of the companions of the Prophet, I guess you translated. And there was also the 1920 Revolution Brigades, um, were all names of some of the more prominent um, Iraqi insurgent groups that, again, didn't really approve of killing civilians. They were just trying to target American troops. Again, by the, eventually, the sectarian hatred got so bad that everyone kind of dropped those wars and was just killing whoever. But that was these main resistance groups. That was their focus. And they even tried to. I remember at the time kind of thinking before I found some more resources like some of their websites and stuff so I could read more about them in Arabic, feeling pretty frustrated that how come you can't get any information about it. And even in 2005 when I was in, in Baghdad, people just didn't like really talk about it. People would talk about the, they were just called the, you know, the noble resistance, but they didn't. People that were part of the resistance, of course, were never admitted. They would just say, oh yeah, like I think the resistance is good, even if they were like it, obviously, but the idea is they just had to keep it super, super secret because of um, U.S. intelligence trying to track them down. Um, you know, for all these different reasons, if you're running an insurgency, you have to just basically try to avoid drawing attention to yourself. So they never really even tried to articulate their demands that well. 
And also it was very fractious. I mean, again, there was just like all these different groups. There wasn't just one leadership. Um, they were all just kind of like they're in this area. It would be like the 1920 Revolution Brigades in Automia, for example, that they would be dominant. And in this other area, it would be the Islamic Army. And they, uh, it just wasn't like centrally coordinated or anything like that. It was just kind of like grassroots, um, grassroots resistance. And these groups, because they first tolerated Al Qaeda. That's another kind of mistake they made was not coming out forcefully enough and condemning uh, Al Qaeda and what they were doing with suicide bombings and killing civilians and things. But they kind of tolerated Al Qaeda because, again, their main enemy was the U.S. But eventually, Al Qaeda tried to impose their will on the other insurgent groups. And so, especially in 2007, when some of these groups started deciding to maybe like call a truce with the U.S., a lot of fighting broke out between the Sunni nationalist resistance groups and. Uh, and Al Qaeda. One example is that um, the main um, like Sunni religious organization is called the Association for Muslim Scholars in Iraq, and their head or spokesperson was a guy named Harak Adari, um, who was a really influential cleric. And his nephew was actually a commander in the 1920 Revolution Brigades, and he was killed um, by Al Qaeda in a car bomb. And to give you again an idea of like the nationalist orientation of these groups, 1920 Revolution Brigades, that's a reference to um, the Iraqi resistance or intifada against British occupation back in 1920. So they, that's how they saw things. Hey, the British occupied us, you know, 80 years ago, and there are more colonialists, um, imperialists coming to occupy Iraq again, and so they. That's how they saw it as, hey, it's all about resistance to occupation. And Harith Adari, again, the leader of the Association of Muslim Scholars, it was his like grandfather who was one of the leaders of um, the resistance against the British all the way back then. So that was their orientation. It wasn't about Islam, even though they're Muslims. Um, and a lot of them were, were religious, but it was like, I mean, there was always a religious element to get names like the Islamic army. And there's even like Muhammad's army was named another one. But their orientation was basically nationalist. It wasn't. It wasn't about killing Shiites. Um, it wasn't about opposing an Islamic state. It was just about getting rid of the occupiers. So that's something again that just a lot of people don't realize about the insurgency. And even though those are the main groups in Iraq by the Americans, you just never even heard their names. Even people that were really pretty knowledgeable about the Iraq situation, like unless you read Arabic, you just never. His name just never even came up. So. Um, at any rate, I guess um, probably just cut it there if you guys have any questions. Let's give him a hand. Yeah, I was wondering if you can't, uh, if you wouldn't say a little bit more about the first Iraq war and the sort of support and disaster that we created by, you know, by engaging in imperialism and supporting Saddam, Gassim the Kurds, and things like that. Um, yeah, real quick. I, I was just glad that that's also my question. You talked oh. about the Iran Iraq Civil War, the development of Saddam's favorite, uh, rise of favoritism in uh, the United States. Okay. Well, in, uh, when the Islamic Revolution happened in Iran in 1979, that made Saddam really scared because Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran was openly calling for the overthrow of the Iraqi government. And there, because there's a large Shiite population in Iraq, and of course the Shiite you know, revolution in Iran, Saddam got really, really scared about that. And so he ended up killing a bunch of Shiite clerics. And maybe you guys have heard of Muqtada Asadr, who's a big Shiite cleric that's the head of the Mahdi army right now. Uh, of the Sadr movement. His um, father and uncle were both really famous Shiite clerics that were murdered by Saddam um, and a bunch of his brothers and his aunt. So Saddam was super scared about that. And so he, once Khomeini was making these calls for a Shiite revolution in Iraq, he was, Saddam was like, okay, this is my chance to invade Iran, prevent a revolution where I'm overthrown in my own country. You know, the Iranians are going to be weak right now because they just had a revolution. A bunch of their generals were all in jail or had been executed by the, by the new Islamic uh, Republic. 
And so he launched an invasion. Now, the US is really happy about that because the Shah, who was overthrown in the Islamic Revolution in 79, was our good friend. And so the US gave um, Saddam a lot of help during the Iran Iraq War to help him fight against our common enemy, the Iranians. So during that time, the Kurds, who are an oppressed minority in Iraq, they make up about 20% of the population, they actually started fighting on the side of the Iranians against the Iraqi government the Iraqis again, because of the bad treatment they experienced for decades. And so that's when you have Saddam um, gassing Kurds, like in the city of Balanja that you hear about, over 5,000 people were killed through chemical weapons by Saddam, and whole Kurdish villages being destroyed, and um, hundreds of thousands of people being moved from their regular villages near the Iranian border into like concentration or internment camps. And again, the U.S. supported him very strongly during that whole period. Eventually, though, after the Iran-Iraq War ended, it just kind of ended in a stalemate. About a million people died, supposedly. The Iraqis were so short on money, they had spent all of, you know, all of their money to try and fight the war. And they had taken a lot of loans from other Gulf countries to continue fighting the war. And so, in 1991, the um, Kuwaitis were overproducing. They were producing more than they were allowed under their OPEC quota of oil, producing more oil than they were which was pushing prices down, oil prices. And again, Saddam needed high oil prices to try and you know, just rebuild the country and pay back all these loans. And so when the Kuwaitis refused to, um, to just stick to their quota and kept overproducing, um, Saddam kept warning him and warning him in front of He's like, oh, that's it. And so he invaded Kuwait. And there were a lot of ways in which that in, uh, occupation of Kuwait could have been ended through negotiations and things. Um, but the U.S. was just really determined to go to war. They just said, hey, we, you know, we're, um, that's, this guy, we can't control him. And they were trying to prevent having a strong Arab country in the region. So they saw that as an excuse to go in, basically wipe out Saddam's army, kill as many members of the army as they possibly could, and also to um, totally destroy Iraq's infrastructure. So, I mean, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people that died as a result of the U.S. bombing like power plants, water treatment plants. And with the sanctions, there's no way that Saddam could bring equipment in to rebuild all that stuff. And so you know, having little kids drinking dirty water, you know, dying of cholera, diarrhea, and things like that. So there's problems, I mean, it's hard to say exactly, but at least 500,000 Iraqi children died um, as a result of the war in 91 throughout the period of the sanctions up until 2003. And that was openly acknowledged by members of the Clinton administration. They knew it was killing all these Iraqi kids, but they didn't really care. Um, does that cover it, I guess? Yeah. Okay, right. Oh, I was, was just going to... Was there someone else? Or was you? Oh, it was him in the back. I was just going to add on to yeah, what I was going to say. I guess why um, it's also like an option of that. I just wanted to ask about the... Um, if you could say a little bit more about the Awakening Councils, and those are U.S.-sponsored Iranian groups that are fighting in Iraq, and maybe just comment on the contemporary relationship of Iraq and Iran. Um, yeah, sorry, the Awakening Council were Sunnis. So oh. they are former Sunni insurgents that were fighting against the U.S. Okay. Like in places like Fallujah, and eventually again they were surrounded on all sides, fighting the Americans, fighting the Iraqi government, so they finally were like, cut a deal with the U.S. General Petraeus was really involved in that. He's like, hey, I'll pay you guys money and give you weapons. Okay, so they were Iraqi fighting. Sunnis. Iraqi Sunnis, yeah. Okay, okay. All right, yeah, I guess that answers it. And then the current relationship, again, the, the current Iranian government has a really, really good relationship with the current Iraqi government because the people in the Iraqi government today and that were in charge, have been in charge of the Iraqi government ever since the U.S. invaded are all members of Shiite political parties and all these people had been in exile in Iran for like, you know, 20 years previous to the war. And they all just came back to Iraq again with the Americans and were able to take power. A lot of Iraqis boycotted the elections and things like that because they opposed the occupation. But these Shiites coming from Iran you know, they, that was just their way to power, basically. And they're like, yeah, we'll participate in the government, we'll help the Americans. So, again, it's that weird thing where you have, like, the Iraqi government is a very close ally of Iran and a very close ally of the United States at the same time. 
from the groups that were fighting the U.S., um, both Sunni and Shiite were the groups that hated the Iranians. So weird. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Nora Maliki and like what's going on now, and like um, how um, like I know there's been some corruption going on there. Like, do you know much about that? Um, not so much about like current stuff, but they're like crazy stories of corruption generally. So when people refer to the current Iraqi government, a lot of times they say under Saddam there was one uh, Ali Baba, which is like what they call like a thief from the story from the 2001 nights, right? Saddam was like one Ali Baba, and now with the new government there's like thousands of them. So I mean everybody understands that in the Iraqi government there's just like insane amounts of corruption. And there, I mean there are stories of literally like um, even in one instance um, like ten billion dollars from a particular ministry disappearing like back in two thousand four. I mean just like one incident. So there's just insane amounts of corruption. I don't have like any super super recent information about that, but everybody knows that that's what's what's going on, and it pisses people off because they don't have electricity. They don't have clean water to drink. Literally, I mean, there's like two or three hours of electricity every day. And in Baghdad, it's like 120 degrees um, during the summer. And so it kind of just drives people crazy. And there's tons of generators. Like, you can't walk down the street in Baghdad without it. It's like so noisy. And there's just exhaust fumes everywhere because everyone has to run separate little generators to have like any, any power. And it's just burning gasoline, you know, obviously running off of gasoline. And, and, uh, in addition, the the infrastructure situation is so bad that, I mean, there's a lot of places in Baghdad where there's just sewage, like, flowing through the streets. In Sadr City, especially, it's a big Shiite slum, um, where we thought that Sadr and the Mahdi Army are really powerful. But, um, I mean, there's just sewage running through the streets, and little kids are just flooding in it all the time. It's really bad. Yeah, um, <clears throat> would you speak to why you consider it to be a fearless war in the types of world about that are going on, such as Blackwater, Albert, Exclusive contracts with the US. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of that. I mean, that was the other thing, too. There's this promise to, to rebuild Iraq. We're going to rebuild Iraq. And that was just another running joke because, like, you didn't see anything. Like, nobody saw any rebuilding going on anywhere. Most of the money for rebuilding, again, they wouldn't even let Iraqi companies do it. They would give no bid contracts, say, to Halliburton or other US contractors that would just basically do nothing, put the money in their pocket. If they try to do anything, they would then like maybe subcontract to maybe some Iraqis, but the vast majority of the money would just go to the American contractors. Um, and so there was basically no no rebuilding. I mean, that was just like a myth, just like a big joke. I mean, maybe they would, after bombing a school in the deep, the, they maybe rebuild it, paint it or something. But like there was no reconstruction that was actually meaningful at all. There's just mostly PR stuff. You know? to school and you take some photos and try to make it look like you're helping the country after you just destroyed everything, you know. So that was this weird dynamic too where in the military, you hear that from a lot of soldiers too, like, well, you know, we're helping them, we're building schools. But it's like, well, yeah, but you guys are the ones that destroyed it in the first place, you know, and killed people and arrested people and tortured people. So you can build all the schools you want. Iraqis aren't going to be grateful about that, you know. Um, but then again, another big part of the war was just to make money for Lockheed Martin. There was actually an executive of Lockheed Martin. I think his name, was, I think his name was Peter Jackson. There's actually a pretty good article in um, Playboy magazine that talks about this. If anyone reads Playboy for the articles, um, <laughs> it's like lock, stock, and two smoking barrels um, by a guy who wrote about um, how there was uh, an executive of Lockheed that was literally in the White House helping come up with plans about how to sell the war to the public. And it's pretty much all Lockheed weapons that were used, especially in the initial invasion, all the airplanes, all the missiles and bombs and things like that. So there's a lot of people, including in Dick Cheney with his wife, et cetera, who had, a, who had an interest in Lockheed, a lot of stock and things like that. And so um, Lockheed stock you know, went through the roof uh, as a result of the war. So you have big oil benefiting, you have Lockheed Martin, Halliburton, Blackwater, and then um, you also have even like Chevrolet, all the Iraqi police that were driving around, you know, murdering, torturing everybody. They all drove these like brand new, you know, Chevy 
pickup trucks. Um, so there was just a lot of money to be made. I mean, anytime there's a country that's closed to like Western goods, and I mean, that's probably a big reason why, again, in my view, the Libya situation, I think it was like, you know, an indigenous uprising that the U.S. didn't, you know, cause or foment. The U.S. was totally caught off guard. They didn't know what would happen in Egypt. They didn't know these revolts were going to break out everywhere. Obviously, they're freaking out. It, it totally scares them that that happened in Egypt. They're trying to prevent it uh, or keep the dictatorship in Bahrain in place, they're trying to keep the dictatorship in Yemen in place. So they were caught off guard by all this stuff. But of course, the two countries where it could actually benefit the United States for there to be like a regime change is in Iran. Well, that seems to kind of died off. I don't see much of the news about protests in Iran anymore. Um, and also in Libya, because even though Libya and the U.S. were on better terms after like 2003, you know, the U.S. doesn't have military bases there. The U.S. doesn't sell weapons to the Libyans. There's not close military um, collaboration. Unlike what you have in Bahrain, where there's the U.S. 5th Fleet, one of our biggest naval bases, right in the heart of um, where all the oil is in the world. And also the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, um, the United Arab Emirates, etc., they buy about $80 billion of weapons from the United States every year. So that's why it's crucial to keep those dictatorships in power. But if the Libyans are rising up against um, Gaddafi, where we don't have we haven't penetrated the country, so to speak, and we don't benefit and like have his, you know, all that oil money, you know, going into American pockets by selling weapons and things like that. And again, by not having you know, military bases there, etc. That's why it's like, okay, you guys want to overthrow Gaddafi? All right, yeah, we'll help him, and they, you know, actually drop bombs and do all this stuff. Um, so again, there's just major, major economic benefits that come from invading a country like Iraq that previously was totally closed off to any Western economic penetration. And so that's why you have all these lobbyists and things like that, like this executive from Lockheed pushing a war because they need to make a lot of money from that. Um, as far as the economic situation in Iraq now, um, who, what are the, so there are American corporations, especially in there. For example, I mean, food corporations and things like, what, who is in power um, as far as the economy goes in Iraq? Well, it's, it's not even just U.S. companies, because when you open up an economy like that, it's actually kind of like hard to totally control like, who, who gets in. But it just kind of opened it up to companies from all over the world. So Iraq was flooded with goods from just like all over the place. But they're not Iraqi companies. Right. So I mean, that just makes it even harder for the Iraqi economy to do everything, to do anything, because there's suddenly all these like cheap imports. and. Um, I mean, the same thing just like in Mexico or Haiti when you get rice or corn dumped on the economy, dumped on the country from outside where things can be produced more efficiently or their government subsidized. It just destroys, you know, the ability of locals there in that country to produce anything and like support themselves. So, um, and I mean, there is so much violence that it's made it difficult for a lot of companies to go in there. But again, it's really clear, there's a, some, a couple of Washington Wall Street Journal articles that lay this out really clearly, that conservatives in the Bush administration basically wanted to make Iraq a test case for being able to spread free market um, you know, economic systems, or free market capitalism in the Middle East. And so they had this really elaborate plan that they drew up, which again was just trying to make it into this kind of like um, Milton Friedman-esque paradise where there's no regulation, flat tax, um, you know, uh, total foreign ownership of the banking system, selling off all the state-run industries. I mean, they just kind of saw it as like this laboratory, you know, in the same way that, that um, Milton Friedman saw Chile after Pinochet. You know, came power. So you were saying that the oil in Iraq is still national. Again, Bremer, like during the first year of the occupation, Bremer just like sold everything off and privatized everything. The one thing he was able to privatize was oil, again, because Big Oil and James Baker intervened and stopped it. And so the plan in that regard was again keep Iraqi oil production low, which is right now is even lower than it was before the war under Saddam, 
in oil companies is a great thing. Secondly, there is tons of oil there. So if somebody is going to make money off it, it might as well be the U.S. oil companies, right? But the way they did it is not in the way traditionally a colonial power would, which is like, you know, in Iran back in the 50s where like the British, which is British Petroleum, literally was the oil industry in Iran. You keep it in Iraq, technically publicly owned or under Iraqi government control. <clears throat> but because Iraq was in so much debt, which was a carryover from the Iran-Iraq war even, like I mentioned, they owed money, tons of money to the Kuwaitis. James Baker was a lawyer for the Kuwaitis on behalf of the Kuwaitis to get money out of the Iraqis, right? So they had, they owed so much money not only to other Gulf countries, but also to the IMF, the international community, international lenders generally, that the IMF came in after the war and they're like, um, we're gonna have structural readjustment, which again was why they demanded ending the rations and continuing to privatize everything. So the IMF basically said, well, in exchange for us forgiving some of this debt, which they couldn't pay back anyway, so it's not like you're doing them a favor. They were going to relieve some debt they'll never pay, be able to pay back anyways. The IMF said, in, 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 in um, exchange for doing that, then you need to sign production sharing agreements with these Western oil companies. And a production sharing agreement is basically where if an oil company comes in and like for the Iraqi government, they provide some services to like process or produce oil, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Even, again, the, 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 the US oil companies wouldn't technically own any of the oil, but they would just like, you know, provide services to the Iraqi oil company basically, which in and of itself isn't a bad thing. But because Iraq was in such a weak bargaining position, and the IMF is saying, hey, we're not gonna really forgive this debt unless you sign these types of contracts, and you sign it in a way in which American oil companies will be able to take like a large percentage of any of the revenues of any oil that's produced. So if there's actually a strong country like Saudi Arabia, for example, yeah, you might sign agreements with Western oil companies to come and help you out and do things, but because the Saudi government is strong, they can get a good deal and say, hey, we're gonna pay you American oil companies like this much, you know. But the Iraqi government, which is totally weak, an American puppet under pressure from the IMF, they're then pressured into signing contracts where American oil companies get this much of the revenue. You know? So under the, the the deals that were signed, like the Iraqi government, you know, was probably going to lose out on about thirty or forty billion dollars so over the course of like the nineteen-year contracts that they were supposed to sign. And because they're signed under occupation, I mean, they couldn't they couldn't be changed. You know, it was like binding. So, uh, Chris. Uh, yeah. So ostensibly, we ended combat operations last year. Um, well, I mean, that's actually one reason why Maliki is, is actually increased in popularity is because he's kind of shown a little bit of independence. Again, he's like pretty close to the Iranians, and it's hard to say he's like totally an American puppet because when George Bush initially, their plan was to sign a status of forces agreement where the United States would just be able to stick around again for 50 years like John McCain was advocating, and Maliki basically told him to kind of screw off and said, no, like all U.S. forces are going to be out by 2011, and we're not going to let you guys do this, we're not going to let you do that. And so the Bush administration totally had to back off what were their, like, actually the things they wanted in the status of forces agreement, which would, again, dictate the ability of the U.S. forces to stay there in the future. But that being said, the U.S. still is able to maintain the, you know, a big presence in Iraq in terms of having, like, tons of advisors there, private contractors, and our embassy is like the biggest embassy in the world in Baghdad. So even though technically like combat forces are going to be out of the country, there still be all these trainers, and the U.S. will still have a lot of weapon Do you know how many military bases there are that were set, at least as a result of this war? Um, no, I don't. I mean, there's definitely a lot. I mean, they were building new bases, new air bases. There seemed to be like one major one up in the north of Kurdistan, one major, major base in Anbar province, and then another major one down in the south. But in addition to those two big ones, there were like lots of other smaller ones, a lot of which they did actually like give back to the Iraqis. Because again, their, their idea is, hey, we don't want to be policing this country. We don't want to actually 
responsible for anything. We just want to have our big military bases where we keep our forces pretty much out of sight. Is that you know for them, and then that way, you know, if there's ever we've got uh, even if we don't have that many people there, you can you have equipment, you have all the logistical stuff set up where you can just like have a bunch of soldiers show up at those huge bases and then you know, use those to launch a war against the Iranians. So the U.S. doesn't want like a big presence where there's soldiers patrolling the streets or anything like that, and they definitely want to avoid that, but still have bases that they can use to project power throughout you know, that area. AJ? Um, yeah, do you have any um, information about the approximate number of uh, foreign security Contractors or uh, mercenaries in Iraq right now? Uh, no, I don't have any current information. But back in the day, it was like big, I mean, it was a big number, almost as many as there were troops. And part of the, con the number of contractors there, it's also people from like the Philippines that are like preparing food and washing dishes for U.S. Um, forces. But you'd also have, you know, the actual like mercenaries. This is another way in which like Blackwater made a lot of their money. There was actually a, a guy that grew up in my ward when I was a kid. Like our families were like good family friends. And it turns out he was in Iraq as like a Blackwater mercenary at the same time I was. And so we actually met. I went in the green zone, which is like the US compound, I had lunch with them at like Burger King. I've got a picture, you know, me standing in front of those big swords, if you guys have seen those that were in Baghdad, they take them down now. Uh, at any rate, so we had lunch with this guy. He's telling me about it. I mean, literally, they make um, you know they make a thousand dollars a day, and they the Blackwater mercenaries were doing tons of security detail, especially for State Department people, like diplomats, etc. Even Paul Bremer had like Blackwater guards. He didn't have any of those military guard, you know. and they would drive around in these black suburbans all throughout Baghdad, and everybody hated them because they would you know drive like maniacs with um, machine guns sticking out of the windows and. I mean, just like U.S. troops would also like shoot people if a car got too close to them. You know, the Blackwater people would, would do that all the time as well, um, driving like crazy, shooting people randomly. I mean, there's that really bad incident um, where I think they, they, they killed like 19 civilians at this long like, traffic circle you know, back then. You guys probably heard about, but there's lots and lots of smaller incidents. Sorry, I thought you'd be done at nine. Any, any last question, maybe? Uh, cool. Thanks, guys.